So, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, before we take some questions from the room, I uh, had a question myself. Um, at the end of your talk, you posed the question, what does it mean to be the viewer of research? I was actually wondering what you would uh, answer to that at the moment, in the current state we are in. Uh, do you have uh, a recent observation or uh, something to share on that note? Because I'm, I'm really interested in that. Uh. Um, I, I, the collective I work with, Free Thought, we, um, I mean, we're sort of half-assed curators. I, I wouldn't sort of attribute curator to our, our uh, practice. But we, um, our, our, our curatorial activity is research driven and in a way it, it formats itself as research. And um, so I think the, the, the reason I want to think about it is the experience we've had in several recent projects where I looked at the people who came to see what we were doing and they looked utterly exhausted and the, the and they looked exhausted almost from the first moment it wasn't that they got exhausted they looked exhausted a priori and there was something about um the fact that so much was sort of of, of being handed to them and it made me realize that we know a lot about research and we we know a bit about the exposition of research we have not a clue about being the viewer of research, and that I really need to think about it. And it's in so at so many levels. The, I curated a um, show of of, um, of the work of a video artist, and what we had there was sixty hours of video in a museum that was opened three days a week for four hours in the afternoon. <laughs> so the the sort of, of it was entirely impossible to actually ever see the show and the and i was thinking well is that the point of it that it be consumed in its entirety so there are so many questions that have to do with um shifting temporalities shifting frameworks um knowing how to <coughs> engage rather than explain all of the things that i think have to happen in relation to the viewing of research. But I, I think we haven't got a clue. Um. Should I? Yeah. Um, you touched upon the precarious studies of precarity in your talk. And I thought perhaps um, as a precarious worker myself, maybe I'm the right person to ask you to elaborate on it. I think I think that the um, you know there are two dimensions of precarity. One is the sort of of extreme anxiety that accompanies it, in the sense that there is absolutely no way of planning one's life in a traditional sense of thinking. You take that step and that step, and then you get to that third step and whatever. But there's also the the um, I think. And an another dimension of that anxiety is the fact that so many people need to change their know-how, right? So they need to, to take up different kinds of knowledges in order to be able to fit into all kinds of emergent markets, technologies, and so on. But the, the sort of, of the, the kind of macroeconomics that I used to read simply have nothing to say towards precarious labor markets. And so the the kind of the question is how do you think precarity not in terms of proven lines which is what the kind of more traditional economics does but how do you think precarity in terms of precisely the amalgam of what I'm calling conditions which is anxieties shifting temporalities um, a kind of sense of constantly redundant knowledges, what you knew yesterday is not applicable tomorrow, and so on. So the, the um, and of course, part of precarity is you can't, you cannot produce a narrative, you know, that, that kind of expands 
according to the lines that we're used to narrative is expanding. And so I think it's that. I can't apply this economic theory, right? Or this psychoanalytic theory, because, or this notion of, of, of a shifting temporality. So I think that's what I'm getting at. So um, the lights are a bit uh, much. I'm going to stand here to see if there's any questions um, in the room for Irit. Yeah, I want to um, uh, connect to what you said about of, uh, museums being places of r erased memory or of um, yeah, collecting memories, but also of erasing memories. Listening to you, I wondered whether you think that museums as places to, let's say, stimulate this interaction more than only giving a presentation, are the right places still or should be there another sort of place to offer that sort of, yeah. Well, uh, and, you know, I, I think at the heart of our thinking about museums is um, a kind of, of enlightenment-driven model of uh, the universal museum, you know, with its ever-elastic kind of frameworks that can just expand and expand and include every story. Mm -hmm. But of course that's not the case. And the, the um, so I, I think, you know, to begin with, we need a really shifting notion of what a museum is. It's not an infinitely elastic expanding entity and it's, that's not what it should be aiming for. But um, what I was telling you was a story of something I saw Theaster Gates do, and I'm a great, great admirer of Theaster Gates because he has the ability to kind of take a set of concerns and then act them in a way that doesn't reproduce them. Mm -hmm. He's one of the very few I know who are able to enact an institution without either count, you know, flailing against it or, or uh, reproducing it. And so I thought, well, if the Astrogates can come into the Pompidou and basically raise the roof and make the windows shake, yeah, the, the sort of, it just needs to be differently inhabited yeah. and it needs to think of its role in the world mm -hmm. completely differently. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. And I had a brief question. Uh, I work at an art, uh, art academy, and um, so I'm hoping to get some advice. How can we stimulate the becoming research, not just as individuals, but as, as a collective? That's a really good question. And I don't think I have an answer, but... Sorry. I, no, it's, it's really, it's important to be confronted with the unanswerable. Um, I think that what, what I'm talking about collectively is the exact opposite of, of ideology. But I'm, what I'm talking about, if, when we operate collectively, it's not because we espouse this ideology or that ideology, but because we create a kind of intensification of knowledges through a set of proximities. And the, um, so the, the collective that I work with, which is an occasional collective, the, we, we come from very different knowledges academically and politically, um, and we disagree about almost everything. And through endless rounds of conversation, everything takes us about 10 times longer than it would take like a really professional practice. But in the end, what we really agree on is the urgencies. So we constitute ourselves constantly around urgencies which we re can recognize in each other's kind of spheres of practice. And I think that's, you know, we, we, we don't collectivize, I mean, you know, back to, to Agamben, neither French nor red nor Muslim, right? The, not nationality, not ideology, not ethnicity, but the convergence around a kind of recognition that a similar urgency underwrites each one of our sort of 
purposes. I'm being short because you had two more. Oh, I thought you had three questions. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for this. Uh, um, I love it that you brought up Theaster Gates blowing the roof off the Pompidou. If I could add to that story, Hello. if I could add to that story, I was about 16 or 17 and me and my sister were sent to Paris because my mum was working in London and because she had to work. And uh, she sent us to Paris to stay, to stay with some queer uncles. And they wanted to, us to educate ourselves in Paris. So they, they gave us some money every morning to go out and see stuff. And they encouraged us to go to the Pompidou. But we weren't brave enough and we couldn't find it. And we ended up eating hot dogs in the, in, on the roof of a, of a, of a, of a supermarket. So, I, so I, I love to hear this story about um, echoes from the past and how we kind of transform the kind of information that we need to, to have in the future. I, I wonder, it made me think about the Caribbean scholar Edouard Glisson and how he talked about the Echo Mond. And I wondered if um, that was something that had come into your work and whether you could say something about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think there's a great, you know, I, I, I'm not that fond of sort of academic name dropping and, it, you know, the endless footnoting of everything. But the, this, this is work that um, touches and shapes. But, you know, the, the and as you were speaking, I was thinking that, for me, um, Glisson and I'm trying to think of the name of the it's a great St. Lucian poet died two years ago, and I've suddenly the name is suddenly lost to me. Uh, Derek Walcott, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and the way in which Isaac Julian has taken it their work up in several films, but mostly in Paradise Omeros. And the fact that it's like that, it's, it's sort of circular. It's um, the, this, the, the way in which Glisson produces a frame, Walcott produces a language, Julian produces a set of images, and a, a kind of moment can be revisited in many modalities and and um, and, a, and a kind of multi-sensory uh, way, and so th there are so many people that um, you know, so many voices that have, have come together in these conversations. But what I'm really interested in in this moment of creative practices is the way in which each voice takes up another and kind of adds a dimension. And so what we get is not knowledgeable knowledge, but in a way, knowability, right? That the, these practices are producing states of knowability. And, um, and so that I don't have to isolate and say, as Derek Walcott said, or as Edouard Glisson said, and you know, quote, et, et, et cetera. It's, it's a very different set of dancing around one another. Good afternoon. Um, Irit, I was wondering if you would be sympathetic to an interpretation of your presentation as a reparative reading of the way in which the, the discourse of research um, f has entered the Art Academy in Europe since the Bologna Accords. So thinking about the, the, the discourse of research as about demonstrating that creative practices have a use value um, and that they have, a, they, have, they have a right, they are legitimate knowledge producers alongside, as you, you've talked about it before, um, the hard sciences. Well, and, and right now, the, my collaborator, Florian Schneider, and I are just in the middle of this project called Challenge Value, in which we're sort of thinking about how contemporary art practices actually have, are, are producing scales of value that can counter systems of evaluation, which is what kind of dominates um, structured, institutional, and other um, worlds. And so, the, 
Your question made me suddenly flash back to a moment in which I sort of began to be interested in contemporary art, which was probably early 90s or late 80s. And you would walk into a gallery and there'd be a quote by Baudrillard on the wall. And that was all that was needed, right? And then stuff that illustrated that quote was kind of produced. And, um, and I think it's, what, 25 years? Um, how, how far and how much more complex um, the situation is where you can't, there isn't a source be it philosophical thought or body of historical material thought, which then gets elaborated through practice. Practice is producing those bodies. And the, the and I think that's what's interesting. I was I was thinking as as I put together these notes, I was thinking about how is it that maybe over the last three or four years, the majority of kind of important nudges that I've had in terms of learning has come from practice. And the, and it's come from practice not because these were brilliant pure scientific truths, but because in practice what we encounter is always relational knowledge. And that means that it brings a tremendous amount to the table. So you can know it and you can sense it and you can find modes of narration for it. So I don't know if I'm answering your question because I'm not sure I understood your question. But um, I, I don't think research is a tyranny in any way. I thought the quote from Baudrillard on the wall um, that seemed to be there for about eight or nine years, I thought that was a bit of a tyranny. But um, I think that the... the um, the ever-expanding set of perspectives from which one knows and the ever-expanding set of languages that are be de being developed for knowing. Uh, the, and the fact that, you know, like in Easterling's work or in, in um, the Mumbai-based uh, collective camps work, you start from something very small and very odd that doesn't fit into the great narratives of knowledge. And from there, you open and open and open in numerous directions in order to, in a way, produce an entire world. And that seems to me to be the exact opposite of a kind of dictatorial tyranny of thinking. In the beginning of uh, your talk, um, you defended pure, pure research or pure science against applied science. No, you didn't, but you used that term. Uh, and 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 you just mentioned uh, practice, but you you uh, what is some of the difference between learning from the practice as you just phrased it, and uh, what you described in the beginning of your talk as uh, the, let's say the tyranny of practice uh, orientation no, in research. All, all I was trying to sort of say is that the, there had been this notion of pure research; it had been the purview of the sciences largely. Um, with the unending pressures on scientific and technological research to produce, you know, deliverables of, that can be applied, that's become a sort of, of, of it's, it's a slightly empty category now. Um, and the... I think that what's happened is that creative practices have taken up the notion of research and produced something which I think is an alternative to that. So it's, it's, what interests me is not giving value to this or that. I, I'm, you know, I don't know whether pure research is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, my father was a scientist, fought for it all his life, but I don't know that it was a good thing or not. But the, the, it's it's from a very old scheme of knowledge, I think, but the the it's the it's the way in which the ground shifts, new formats get developed. Those new formats are answering 
kind of urgencies of the moment. So I'm not here to say this is good or this is bad. The, the, um, but I do see that there's been a quite considerable shift. And if I may ask a second question directly related to that, if you then say this new types of research are happening in the creative practices, doesn't have this also its own set of risks because, for example, the creative practices are now being framed mostly in the art world. And as we know, the art world is not, let's say, uh, the, the alternative uh, to neoliberalism. In many forms, it's even more extreme form of neoliberalism. So isn't there a danger, let's say, we're getting from one problem into another problem? And it's a pseudo-alternative, uh, almost like in George Orwell, you know, where, where the op op opposition you, party do you, is... Do you know problem-free zones? <laughs> <laughs> there is no problem free zone there is no outside uh, the the um, yes every, everything is given to capture by neoliberalism the the um, the question is and everyone's paddling water basically but the question is what can you do, what can you get done in that moment in which you're paddling water and the and and the thing about research which kind of stands at the intersections of education and artistic practice and institutional activity is that it is an entirely transgenerational terrain right there's there are encounters there that go back and forth across generations and that makes that particular moment of treading water a, a little bit more potent have a little bit more potential.